Viola Lutso is not a household name. Although she was the first female white activist to be killed during the civil rights movement, her name has faded over time. In this video, you will hear the story behind her martyrdom, the tangled aftermath of that story, and the ultimate meaning of her death. From time to time, it is instructive to look back at ugly times in American history, so we can be reminded of basic rights that citizens were denied and their struggle to acquire them. Racial discrimination in the South took many forms based on the infamous Jim Crow laws enacted at state and local levels, but the federal government, through the courts and the legislature, started passing laws in the 50s to compel southern states to comply with the rights and freedoms spelled out in the U.S. Constitution. There were three Civil Rights Acts passed by Congress from 1957 to 1964 dealing with voting rights and other issues of discrimination. Plus there was the U.S. Supreme Court decision of Brown v. the Topeka Board of Education in 1954, which paved the way for ending segregation in public schools. In 1965, leaders of the Civil Rights Movement decided to focus their attention on voting rights for blacks, initially in Selma, Alabama, a city known for its blatant deprivation of rights for black people. In 1901, Alabama rewrote its state constitution to deny the vote to anyone who could not pass a literacy test or could not pay a poll tax. That law specifically targeted blacks, although poor people and uneducated people were also affected. There were other barriers to voting in various locales, like Selma, including opening the registrar's office only two days per month, testing people on their knowledge of the constitution, and requiring a white registered voter to vouch for the registrant. Plus, blacks who tried to register were threatened with loss of employment and the calling in of home and business mortgages. In 1965, in Selma, 50% of the 30,000 population was black, but only 1% of the black people of voting age, or 156 people, were registered to vote, compared to 9,000 whites. Several civil rights leaders planned a march from Selma to Montgomery, the capital, to present their grievances about voting rights to Governor George Wallace. The march would take several days and cover 55 miles along Highway 80. It took three attempts to carry out that plan. The first march occurred on March 7th. Martin Luther King did not lead it due to threats against his life. The march was legally banned by Governor Wallace, but 600 blacks and supporters gathered at Brown Chapel, the starting point. Led by SNCC's John Lewis and SCLC's Hosea Williams, they walked to the Edmund Pettus Bridge three-fourths mile away. Following the marchers were four ambulances. Major John Cloud, head of the Alabama State Troopers, said, Stop! This is an unlawful assembly. Your march is not conducive to public safety. You are ordered to disperse and go back to your church or to your home. Hosea Williams asked to talk. Cloud said, There is no word to be had. You have two minutes to turn around and go back to your churches. When nobody moved, Cloud called out, Troopers, advance. The Selma Sheriff, Jim Clark, shouted, Get all of them. That day in history came to be known as Bloody Sunday. Seventeen people were hospitalized, including John Lewis, who sustained a fractured skull. Martin Luther King and other leaders called for a second march. King sent telegrams to clergy of all faiths, asking them to join him in Selma. With the national publicity, priests, nuns, ministers, and rabbis rushed to Selma, along with students and workers. The second march, scheduled for Tuesday, March 9th, was legally banned as well. 2,000 marchers lined up outside Brown Chapel. At the front of the bridge, a U.S. Marshal stopped them and requested that they postpone the march. Martin Luther King refused and led the marchers up the bridge and over the other side. Major Cloud stopped them again and said that they could go no further. King asked if they could pray and sing. Cloud agreed. In a surprise move, King then turned around. This whole affair was prearranged between King, the White House, Governor Wallace, and an Alabama 
judge. King strategically waited until federal protection was made available. On Monday evening, March 15th at 9 p.m., Johnson addressed both houses of Congress and the nation. Seventy million people listened to a stirring speech in which he called for support of the voting rights bill then before Congress. He stated, It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. There is no constitutional issue here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. There is no issue of states' rights or national rights. There is only the struggle for human rights. I have not the slightest doubt what will be your answer. But the last time a president sent a civil rights bill to the Congress, it contained a provision to protect voting rights in federal elections. That civil rights bill was passed after eight long months of debate. And when that bill came to my desk from the Congress for my signature, the heart of the voting provision had been eliminated. This time, on this issue, there must be no delay or no hesitation or no compromise with our purpose. We cannot, we must not, refuse to protect the right of every American to vote in every election that he may desire to participate in. And we ought not, and we cannot, and we must not wait another eight months before we get a bill. We have already waited a hundred years and more, and the time for waiting is gone. But even if we pass this bill, the battle will not be over. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Judge Frank Johnson approved the 3rd March on Sunday, March 20th, with restrictions. It was limited to 300 people on the two-lane section of Highway 80, but unlimited on the four-lane sections. Governor Wallace refused to provide protection to the marchers. President Johnson sent 2,000 Army troops, including a military police battalion specializing in riot control, 100 federal marshals, and 100 FBI agents. He also federalized 1,800 Alabama National Guardsmen. Troops were on alert at Army bases in Georgia and North Carolina. The area was combed for bombs and snipers. Walking with Martin Luther King were Ralph Bunch, UN diplomat and Nobel Prize winner, U.S. District, District Judge Constant Baker Motley, John Lewis of SNCC, Coretta Scott King, and SELC leaders Andrew Young and the Reverends Ralph Abernathy and James Bevel. On the evening of the Bloody Sunday event, Viola Liuzzo and her husband Jim watched the nightly news where they saw the Alabama state troopers savagely attacking the unarmed and peaceful civil rights marchers. In the days that followed, the city of Detroit held one of the largest demonstrations in the country involving 10,000 people and led by Governor George Romney and Mayor Jerome Kavanaugh. 
the protesters demanded that the federal government provide protection for civil rights workers. Viola Liuzzo was a 39-year-old mother of five who felt fervently about injustice. She was a feisty and fiery redhead, standing only five foot two inches tall, but always standing up for what she thought was right. I spent most of her childhood growing up in the South, particularly in Georgia and Tennessee. She knew firsthand how blacks were treated. At the age of 19, in 1943, when she was in Detroit, she met her soon-to-be best friend, a black woman named Sarah Evans. Sarah worked at a grocery store. One, do, one day, Vi came in looking for pepper, which, during World War II, the owner hoarded for special customers. Sarah told her about the pepper being available, which enraged the owner. Vi said to Sarah, You know, you're the kind of woman I like. You're not afraid to speak up, to stick your neck out. Maybe we could get together and talk sometime. They met frequently in Vi's house for coffee and conversation. It was a most unusual relationship in the most segregated northern city in America. Sarah became Vi's full-time housekeeper and babysitter in the 50s, and Sarah invited Vi to join the NAACP in 1956. Later, in 1964, as a student at Wayne State University in Detroit, Vi got involved in the civil rights movement. Early in 1965, Vi began attending services at the First Unitarian Church in Detroit. She attended a church memorial service for the Reverend James Reeb, 38, who died on March 11th from wounds obtained after a beating in Selma after the first march. Vi also attended weekly meetings held by Reverend Malcolm Boyd, the former Episcopal chaplain at Wayne State University, which were held in his living room. He had been a freedom writer in 1961. On the evening of March 15th, she heard young people talking about their experiences in the civil rights struggle and how they felt about the mounting atrocities in the South. At that time, she made the decision to go with other Wayne State University students to Selma to help with the voting rights march. Boyd stated, one could say that she was a truly religious person, not explicitly religious, but religious in a profound sense. She had a deep spirituality, almost a saintly quality. She was ready to take risks for what she believed in. That week, 250 students staged a sympathy march. Some of the students marched into town to the federal building where a delegation met with the FBI. Vi participated in the march and the demonstration. It was her first such action. On the day she left for Selma, Tuesday, March 16th, Vi went to classes as usual. She only confided to her friend, Sarah Evans, that she was going to Selma. She arranged with Sarah to care for her kids in her absence. She put clothes in a shopping bag to prepare for leaving later in the evening. Before she left Detroit, she telephoned her husband, Jim, to tell him of her plan. Jim and her daughter, Penny, could not talk her out of it. According to Jim Liuzzo, nothing could stop Vi from doing what she thought was right. I couldn't. The children couldn't. Nobody could. The other students from Wayne State University, who agreed to drive to Selma, had changed their minds. Viola drove the 1,000 miles alone over three days in her 1963 green Oldsmobile. Upon arriving in Selma on Friday, March 18th, Vi signed up at the Brown Chapel. She was given the job of welcoming and registering Selma volunteers. She stayed with a black family in a nearby neighborhood and called her husband and kids every night. At the Brown Chapel, she met Leroy Jerome Moten, 19, a voting drive organizer. He had lost his job as a short-order cook when his boss found out about his civil rights actions. He was asked to coordinate the volunteer transportation service. Vi offered her car. On Sunday, March 20th, at noon, Vi joined 3,000 other marchers outside Brown Chapel. After a speech by Martin Luther King, they marched towards the Pettus Bridge, then onto Highway 80 without incident. Where Highway 80 narrowed to two lanes for a stretch of 22 miles, only 300 pre-selected people were allowed to continue the march towards Montgomery. So Vi returned to Selma. Later, on Wednesday, the last day of the march, Vi volunteered to help at the first aid station at the last campsite at the city of St. Jude Catholic Church, one mile outside Montgomery. That morning, she took a bus from the Brown Chapel to St. Jude to join the marchers. She talked to her husband that night. 
She told him that she would be coming home the next night after the Montgomery rally. He warned her to be very careful and that the most dangerous time would be after the president's troops left the area. She told him, I'm assigned to the first aid station. I'm not in the front lines. Don't worry. That night, she slept at her car. On Thursday morning, as the activists gathered to march towards Montgomery, Vi, in a near panic attack, told Father Timothy Deary of the city of St. Jude, Father, I have a feeling of apprehension. Something is going to happen today. Someone is going to get killed. Vi, walking in her bare feet, joined about 3,000 other marchers for the final march to the Alabama Capitol building. She stood in the crowd to hear an emotional speech by Martin Luther King. There was an estimated 25,000 to 30,000 people gathered around the Capitol building, the largest crowd ever to assemble for a civil rights event in the South. Vi was warned not to drive that night, particularly in a lone car without the safety of a caravan. She had Michigan plates, and she had a young black man in the car with her, a very risky situation in Alabama. She left the city of St. Jude with Leroy Moton to ferry people back to Selma. It was not an uneventful trip. A car came close up behind her and knocked her bumper. Later, another car rode her bumper and turned their brights on. She was undaunted and incensed by these intimidations. After they dropped the last passengers off in Selma, Vi offered to drive Leroy Moton back to Montgomery around 7 p.m. On March 24th, four members of the Ku Klux Klan drove from Birmingham to Selma on an assignment from their Klan leader, Robert Thomas. At 6.20 p.m. on Highway 80, they were pulled over and got a warning ticket from a state trooper for having a noisy muffler. The Klansmen were driving a red and white two-door Chevy Impala. After driving around Selma looking for an opportunity to harass civil rights workers, they started to leave town over the Edmund Pettus Bridge when a light green Oldsmobile pulled up next to them at a red light. Viola Liutza was the driver, and Leroy Moton was in the front passenger seat. One of the Klansmen pointed to the car and said, Look a there, baby brother. I'll be damned. Look a there. The driver said, Let's get him. The Klansman followed her for 20 miles and attempted four times to pass her car. Knowing she was being followed, Vi raced ahead at speeds reaching 95 miles per hour. The Impala finally overtook Vi's car, pulled up alongside her, and fired a volley of shots at the car. At the time, Vi was humming, We shall overcome. She died instantly. The car swerved off the road, hit a ditch, and came to a stop against a barbed wire fence. Leroy Moton was not hit by any bullets, but was roughed up in the crash. He turned off the lights and the engine and tried to get Viola to speak. After getting no response, he noticed the other car had returned, and a man got out to investigate. He quickly fell to the floor and pretended to be dead. The beam of a flashlight shone into Vi's car. Then the man returned to his own car and left. Moton waited 30 minutes then ran almost three miles down Highway 80 until he was able to flag a truck that he recognized belonged to the movement. The truck drove to the Selma police station where Moton was held and interrogated by the FBI and local police officers. Although he had sustained a dislocated shoulder, he was not given medical treatment for 24 hours. Alabama Highway Patrol police located Vice Carr and found her body in the driver's seat. By 11 p.m. that night, Federal authorities in the FBI, the White House, and the Justice Department knew that Viola Liuzzo had been shot, but none of these authorities contacted her husband, Jim Liuzzo, to let him know what happened. An SCLC official made the call at 12.10 in the morning. I have some very bad news for you. Your wife has been shot. Jim Liuzzo asked, is it serious? They answered, it's critical. She's dead. Chaos and grief descended on the family, and a nightmare began that never completely went away. TV crews and reporters enveloped the house. Friends and neighbors poured in. Jim tried to call President Johnson during the early morning hours, but he did not get through. But President Johnson did call Jim Liuzzo the next day to offer condolences. Jimmy Hoffer, the Teamsters president, called about every hour on the hour. The police found a handwritten note in Viola's car, apparently written to one of her professors shortly before she left. 
Prior to today, I felt that any personal contribution I might offer to those individuals in distress in Selma, Alabama, was of little or no significance. I also had concluded that even if such efforts should prove at all helpful, they would have to wait until the quarter's end. Nevertheless, upon reading the content of our President's speech today, I am no longer able to sit by while people are suffering. I examined carefully my own possible reaction if I were one of the Selma victims, not just a spectator. Her husband later said, Vi thought people's rights were being violated in Selma, and she had to do something about it in her own way. That was her downfall. So many times I told her, one of these days, the humanitarian things you do are going to backfire. On Saturday, the Lutzos got the news that Governor George Romney of Michigan had declared Monday and Tuesday days of statewide mourning for Viola Liuzzo. Various dignitaries visited the Liuzzo house during that time. The NAACP sponsored a memorial service on Monday night at the People's Community Church. 1,500 to 2,000 people turned out for the event. The final rites for Mrs. Liuzzo were held at the family place of worship, the Immaculate Heart of Mary Roman Catholic Church. A capacity crowd of family, friends, neighbors, and dignitaries filled the church, while outside hundreds more crowded the sidewalk. Among the officials who came to pay their respects were Martin Luther King, Congressman Charles Diggs, and un Union officers Walter Ruther and James Hoffa. Only one day after the funeral, a burned cross was found in the family backyard. Jim arranged for a security guard to watch the house. There were people calling in the middle of the night, shouting obscenities and threats. By 8.10 a.m., the morning after Vi's murder, J. Edgar Hoover gave President Johnson the extraordinary news that the FBI had already cracked the case. They had acted on information provided by an informant. Four murder suspects, all members of the Ku Klux Klan, were arrested later that morning. They included Collie Leroy Wilkins, Jr., 21, on the left, Eugene Thomas, 43, in the middle, and William Orville Eaton, 41, on the right. The fourth suspect was Gary Thomas Rowe, 31, known as Tommy Rowe. They were charged with conspiracy to injure and intimidate persons in the exercise of their civil rights under the Federal Conspiracy Act of 1870, where it's a federal crime for two or more persons to conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any citizen in their free exercise of any right or privilege secured him by the Constitution of the United States. The FBI informant was Tommy Rowe, one of the men arrested, who had been working for the FBI since 1960 when he infiltrated the KKK chapter in Birmingham. Rowe was a tough, mean cookie. Many years later, after the FBI files were made available to the public through the Freedom of Information Act, Rowe was implicated in some of the worst hate crimes in American history, including the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, where four little girls were killed. He was on the FBI payroll for five years. In exchange for his testimony, Rowe was given immunity by John Doerr, Assistant Attorney General of the United States. Fewer than three weeks after the murder, all federal charges against Rowe were officially dropped. While packing a gun on his hip, Rowe testified against the other three Klan members before a grand jury on April 6th. When Rowe's role as a paid informant went public, he was placed in protective custody. He and his family went into hiding. The state of Alabama also filed ch murder charges against the suspects. The United Clans of America posted a $50,000 state bail bond for each of the three suspects and a $10,000 bail bond for the federal charge. All the men were members of KKK chapters located in and around Birmingham, Alabama. The first Klansman to go to trial for the state murder charge was Collie Leroy Wilkins. He was tried twice. The jury in the first trial, all white males, was deadlocked at 10 in favor and 2 against conviction for manslaughter. The jury in the retrial, all white males, found him not guilty. Eugene Thomas, in a separate murder trial, was found not guilty. William Orville Eaton, the remaining suspect, had a history of heart problems and died of a heart attack before his trial began. In November of 1965, the KKK suspects were tried by a federal jury for the violations of the civil rights of Viola Liuzzo. The trial was conducted at the federal courthouse in Montgomery. John M. Doerr, the assistant attorney general for civil rights and a supporter 
of the civil rights movement prosecuted the case. It was presided over by Judge Frank Johnson, a proponent of civil rights. Once again, the jury was all white and all male. The trial verdict was another deadlock, but the judge requested the jury to return to the jury room to deliberate more. Finally, a guilty verdict was rendered on December 3rd with a maximum sentence of 10 years for each defendant. It's interesting to note that murdering a civil rights activist would not become a federal crime until after the assassination of Martin Luther King. The random but intentional murder of Viola Luzzo after the Selma Civil Rights March makes for a fascinating story. But what happened after her death created an even more extraordinary story, with many twists, turns, and half-truths, and the family of Viola Liuzzo became the next victims of the race crime in Selma. Within hours of her death, J. Edgar Hoover told Johnson that Vi was found with numerous needle marks, suggesting that she might have been taking dope. That was a lie, but it was the beginning of a huge smear campaign to defile the reputation of Viola Liuzzo. Why was it done? Hoover was greatly embarrassed that an FBI informant was involved in a KKK hate crime, and he purposely wanted to draw attention away from Tommy Rowe by discrediting the victim of the crime. The FBI file on Vi was huge, containing 10,000 documents. Hoover amassed a great deal of information about Vi, some truths, some half-truths, and some lies, and he leaked this information out to police departments, government officials, and the press. Vi's FBI file was actually classified for 20 years, so few people knew that the Bureau was investigating her. The picture of Vi that emerged from the FBI descriptions was of a woman who was mentally and emotionally unstable, a woman who was unfaithful to her husband, and a woman with a criminal past. Viola's family ultimately suffered from the national defamation of her character. There is not enough time here to tell all the things that happened to this family. But here are the highlights. Within days of her murder, her sons, Tommy and Tony, were called nigger lovers at school. There were rocks thrown at her six-year-old daughter, Sally, on her way home from elementary school. Garbage was strewn on Liuzzo's lawn. Vi's 1963 Oldsmobile had been impounded in Alabama since Jim stopped making payments on it. The car was later sold at a public auction. The new owner offered to sell Jim Liuzzo the car that his wife was shot in. Due to harassment, Jim pulled his kids out of public school and registered them in a Catholic academy, but they continued to be harassed with racial epithets. The hate mail, obscene phone calls, and threats were relentless. In later years, Tommy and Tony quit high school and began drinking heavily. Jim also was drinking. In July 1979, to retaliate for the federal government's handling of the case, the Liuzzo family filed a lawsuit for $2 million, claiming that the government was responsible for Viola's death. It came to trial in March 1983. Now the Klan members, Wilkins and Thomas, in stark contrast to their earlier trials, testified on behalf of the Liuzzos. They both said that Tommy Rowe was the killer. Thomas claimed that Rowe said, Well, I got him. Damn good shooting. Two Birmingham police officers who interviewed Rowe right after the murder testified that Rowe admitted that he murdered Liuzzo. The case was heard by a judge, since suits against the government could not be adjudicated by a jury. In a 14-page opinion, the judge ruled against the Liuzzo family, saying, Rowe did not kill, nor did he do or say things causing others to kill. He was there to provide information, and his failure to take steps to stop the planned violence by uncovering himself and aborting his mission cannot place liability on the government. The Liuzzo family was ordered to pay court costs of $80,000 in addition to their own legal fees of $60,000. Later, <clears throat> under public pressure, the government reduced and then rescinded the penalty. In 1978, the state of Alabama indicted Roe for first-degree murder based upon the FBI files, Birmingham City records, and an expose on the ABC News show 2020. However, attempts to extradite Roe from Georgia were blocked, and efforts to prosecute Roe were rejected by a federal judge who ruled that the prosecution was based on highly prejudicial evidence and that Roe had immunity. 
The Alabama mur murder trial never happened. In October 1978, a month after Tommy Rose indicted for Vi's murder, Jim Liuzzo suffered a massive heart attack. After recuperating for two months, he had a second stroke and died. In dire straits financially, Jim Liuzzo had become involved in an arson for profit ring and was serving a five year probation at the time of his death at the age of 64. He did not even have enough money to pay for internment in the mausoleum where his wife was placed. After parting with the FBI in early 1966, Rowe received $10,000 in cash, plus got resettled under an alias in Southern California and was also given a job as a U.S. Marshal. Around 1975, Bantam Books offered Tommy Rowe a book deal for $25,000. In 1976, the book, My Undercover Years with the KKK, was published. Columbia Pictures gave him $25,000 for the film rights. A made-for-TV film called the, called the Freedom Riders was released in 1978, starring the football player Don Meredith as Roe. Its name was subsequently changed to Undercover with the KKK. In 2004, the film Home of the Brave, friendly to the Lutzos, debuted at the Sundance Film Festival. It tells the story of Viola Liuzzo's murder and particularly focuses on her adult children and what happened to them after the murder. It is revealed that the Liuzzo brothers, Tommy and Tony, having developed a severe distrust of the federal government, both dropped out of society and went off the grid. The Liuzzo's daughters married and had families and collectively had 12 children. Kali Leroy Wilkins, died in Birmingham, Alabama on December 23, 1994 at the age of 51. Eugene Thomas died sometime between 1994 and 1998, but the date and circumstances are not known. Gary Thomas Rowe, the informant, died of a heart attack in May 1998 at the age of 64 in his hometown of Savannah, Georgia. He was the last survivor of Viola's murderers. He died bankrupt and $60,000 in debt. He was buried under his pseudonym, Thomas Neal Moore, in Savannah. Jim Clark, the sheriff of Selma, who brutally and systematically prevented black Selma citizens from registering to vote in 1964-1965, made the following statement after the Selma marches. Martin Luther King Jr. ruined Selma's way of life. We had a way of life we liked. Ten years later, he was convicted of smuggling marijuana and sentenced to two years in federal prison. So, what eventually came from the death of Viola Liuzzo? Less than five months after her death, President Johnson signed into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Justice Department calls this act the most effective piece of civil rights legislation ever enacted into law. In a nutshell, it prohibits discrimination against racial or language minorities in the voting process. Although Viola was part of a long line of civil rights martyrs, white and black, including Clyde Kennard, Jimmy Lee Jackson, James Reeb, Jonathan Daniels, and many others, her death, more than any other, spurred and quickened the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Also, after her death, the eyes of the country were on the Ku Klux Klan and their nefarious acts. President Johnson encouraged law enforcement agencies to root out and eliminate this terrorist organization. Although it still exists, the Klan organizations have never regained the strength and influence that they had in the 1960s. There are many memorials that recognize the contribution of Viola Liuzzo to the civil rights movement. In 1989, the women of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference placed a stone marker at the site of her murder on Highway 80. It had been defaced many times over the years, and eventually a metal fence was built around it. She is included in the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery in the plaza in front of the Southern Poverty Law Center. She is also honored at the Selma Montgomery March Memorial on the grounds of the Brown Chapel AME Church. In the spring of 2001, the United Universalist Association dedicated a monument to the hundreds of citizens who took a stand for civil rights in Selma. The monument, installed in Elliott Chapel at the UUA headquarters in Boston, commemorated Jimmy Lee Jackson, Reverend James Reeb, and Viola Liuzzo.